Right. Uh, so today, uh, the basic topic will be the data processing part. So before we get into that, I want to uh, overview a little bit what we have discussed last time. And uh, uh, so the first one is what is next generation sequencing? So there's a key words about next generation sequencing. The first one is uh, a sequencing, right? It sequences both the DNA and RNA with modified protocols. What I mean by modified protocol is uh, this equipment really doesn't sequence DNA, uh, RNA. You have to make it back to the DNA so that it sequences it. And the second keyword is short reads. So it can be 35 base pair. Actually, for the earlier platform, it's a 25 base pair and to 100 base pair at the current stage. And some of other platforms, it can go to 400 base pair, which is a 454 technology. And uh, so you can see that you imagine this, this is a reads. And you do not sequence from the very beginning to the end. You only sequence the very beginning part of it, or both two ends. And that is called either mate pair or pair end. And the third keyword is ultra high throughput. So we got a 1 to 1.5 billion rates in one sequencing run. And that's a lot of information to go through. And we also talk about uh, uh, the leading platforms. And the first one is uh, the Illumina platform. And this is uh, really the leading platform. It, cost, it takes about uh, uh, 60 to 70 percent of market share. And uh, the amplification of the Illumina platform is the bridge amplification. And the sequencing is the sequencing by synthesis. And the second most important one is the solid platform, which is also purchased by the Alive technology. And uh, comparing to the Illumina, for the amplification part, it uses motion PCR rather than uh, bridge amplification. And it's sequencing by ligation, not really uh, synthesis. And uh, this is uh, the color space, and which is a very unique feature. I hope you already went through the, the lecture notes, and those will be, uh, hopefully, you, it's clear for that. And uh, the first platform, actually, for the next generation sequencing, I would say the commercial platform is the 454 platform. And uh, we have this, uh, they also call it peri sequencing. This is because of the biochemistry, they, the way they sequence. And the major feature of this is uh, the longer rates. So it's 400 base pair rather than only 50 to 100 base pair. So remember, uh, I have one slide last time to show you the cars, the, the cartoon. So you break the puzzles into bigger pieces or smaller pieces. And, uh, and uh, one of their selling points is uh, if you're sequencing longer rates, it's really easy to recover what you really sequenced to begin with. And this, as I mentioned, this platform came in commercial from 2006, and I believe that Illumina is from 2007, and Solid is from 2008. So they were one year apart from each other. Another major player is uh, the Pacific Biosciences, and uh, this is a single molecule uh, sequencer. So they escaped some of the amplification procedure, which make it uh, have a lot of good features that people can work with. And it's also the nano hole. There's a one lecture notes, if, if you remember, there's a, a hole, a container there, and the polymer is sitting inside it. So you can see the DNA molecule going through it. And uh, while the polymer is going through it, it starts to excite the, the lights so that, that we can read it. And, uh, but uh, it's, it's the real feature is it's a single molecule, and it's nano hole, and it's very long rate. This is really unique rate, uh, unique feature. And it can go to three to five kilobits for each rate. So it's very, very nice. And uh, the last one, uh, but probably will, you will see the market share goes up uh, for another, for diagnosis market, which is Aaron Torrent. And they, this is the personal genome analyzer. So it's not, uh, um, it's, it's a, we are hoping that uh, that in the future, that every lab has can have this kind of sequencer sitting in their on their bench, and uh, and the, if you, you run some small samples, it's it's, it's really doable. And Aaron Torrent is one of those uh, machines to target those kind of market. And uh, the machine itself is very cheap; it's only fifty thousand bucks. So the the trick is they skip those uh, fancy, more expensive camera part. So they, rather than use a uh, semiconductor based technology. Iron system semiconductor is much, make the machine much cheaper. And so far it's lower throughput, uh, but it's very, very fast. So you can get a reasonable amount of sequences in an hour or two. 
And uh, so far, the error rate for the iron current is a little bit higher comparing to the uh, alumina and solid. Uh, last time, one student asked, I, I believe it was Kelly, asked what's the error rate of that. And I, I heard a rumor it's about 10%, but when I go back and look at the, their manuals, actually, it's, uh, the accuracy is 99%. So it's not too bad. It's, it's pretty good, reasonable. But at least that's based on their commercial um, uh, flyers. I don't know how, how real that is, and uh, I think it's remained to be passed. And uh, this one is a summary table, and uh, you, don't, you cannot see that very clearly from the back, but this is what I, I just mentioned, the major features of major platforms. So these are the things, if you want to look for a job in this area, that's, those are something that you need to be familiar with. Okay, and uh, also from last time, so what we can do is this technology. The first one is to sequence the DNA. We can do the de novo sequencing or reference-based resequencing. For us, this is a major application, all right? So your goal of here is to identify the genetic variants in the samples you are sequencing. And uh, it can also sequence uh, the RNA, uh, which is called transcriptome-wide sequencing. And uh, we will have several lectures about it. And this is really try get, trying to get into the market share of microarray technologies. We know that microarray is used to, seek, to, to measure the gene expression, and RNA sequencing can do the same thing and can do even better. And uh, the third one is to study the protein DNA or protein RNA interactions, and which is the ChIP-seq or clip -seq technologies. And the last one is that we can use all this to, to study epigenetics, which include the DNA methylation, histone multiplication, nucleosome positioning, or chromosome looping. And uh, I also spent almost half of lecture to review that the, the applications that uh, were enabled by this technology in recent years. And the first one is uh, the Southern Genome Project. So the basic goal of Southern Genome Project is after we have the reference genome, we want to characterize the variants uh, in our human in different populations. And the Cancer Genome Atlas and International Cancer Genome Consortium, both of them are trying to understand cancer from multiple domain information, including DNA, RNA, methylation, uh, histone modification, and, and the, ev most of the things that you can think of. And, uh, and these are two larger consortium. And also ENCODE project and mode ENCODE projects, uh, those are the basic goal is uh, to annotate our genome. That's where the noise comes from. And uh, I also introduced two concepts, which one is the mate pairs and pair ends, and uh, they look the same. You got DNA fragments, you sequence both two ends, uh, but they have very subtle but important differences. So you can go over that. And, uh, and the multiplexing and barcoding is an important thing that we can keep in mind because, uh, uh, because of those that we can uh, adequately or effectively use the resource that we can get from next generation sequencing because so much data, we don't need that for one individual sample, so we can break one run into multiple samples through barcoding procedures. And the challenge is, is uh, the uh, data analysis, which is about informatics part, and also briefly touch base a little bit on the cloud computing part. So just uh, spend 10 minutes also just to run through what we have last time. And uh, um, if you have any questions, send me an email, and I will try to address those, okay? And uh, today, the lecture is not going to be as exciting as last time. <laughs> so we, we need to go to very detail about the data processing part. I will first talk about the data analysis workflow, very brief introduction, so break the analysis into different pieces. And also, the first thing I want to talk about is, is sequence quality evaluation. Okay, this is a very, it's not really very shiny thing that uh, it's uh, how great this technology is. We want to break down, we want to identify their weakness so that we can use them more effectively. So there's a lot of sequence quality evaluation, fresh scores, and NGS error rates. And uh, one of the major tasks today is to go through the alignment theories. Uh, how many of you have taken any type of bioinformatics class? All right, most of you have. So I'm sure that alignment is a major thing that probably is one of the first things you, you talk about in the bioinformatics class. And uh, everybody is familiar with Smith-Wortman, Smith although I'm still going to talk about it because we have 
students from School of Medicine. And, um, and also, the, one of the major things that I want to go through is uh, the short race aligners. And uh, the, I'm not going to go into detail of any one of it. Rather, I want to summarize uh, the information, what type of uh, alignment algorithm is available, what type of strategies they are taking. And one of the things I want to talk about today is uh, Borrow's Wheeler transformation. And this is, uh, becomes very important in the alignment algorithm right now. And I want to make sure that uh, you know what, what is that. And, uh, and we will struggle together. And to be honest with you, before I, I organized this class, I heard about it. I don't know what that is. So it's pretty fun to figure it out. And, uh, and also, actually, it's one important thing is to compare different aligners. So there's so many different alignment algorithms. Which one to pick? What are the pros and cons for each individual one? And those are the things I'm interested in talking about as well. Uh, another major thing that we probably will spend uh, 45 minutes or so to talk about is the data formats. So this is becomes very detailed and uh, it's not really too much scientific driven, but for the students who are interested in analyze the data and you have to know what different type of data are and uh, what the data formats are, what, what they mean at least. And uh, the last part will be the data visualization and I will briefly go over genome browser and IGV. And this is uh, the part that uh, uh, you can pretty much relax because most of you are already familiar with this. But uh, these are really powerful tools to help us to visualize the next generation sequencing data that we have generated. OK, so data analysis, the processing workflow. OK, so some of the students already seen this class. This is from one of our very, very early experiment. And uh, I, I don't remember which year it was. So this is the data was copied. But I think it was generated in 2008. So by that time, so you can see that this is the file size. And this one is uh, one file is about 4.3 gigabits. So one text file, all right? And, uh, and I want to see how many rows in this file. For this particular one, it's 38 million rows in this one file. And what happens is, uh, what happens is this is what the file will look like. So, so we got 30 file, 30, 38 million such rows, OK? And you got uh, a lot of information regarding the sequencing. Each row corresponding to one read you, you, you get out from the sequencer. And also, there's a lot of uh, characters which doesn't make any sense to any human being. And those are uh, represent the qualities. So these are the things that we will talk about today as well. And uh, the data volume is really uh, humongous. It's really huge. So there's uh, several data uh, stages. The first one is the image processing part. So as, uh, most, uh, as we know that most of the, the, um, the, the sequencers so far is still based on the image, Illumina, Solid, and most of them. Other than Aaron Torrent, I think they are all based on images. And uh, those are huge, huge, huge images. It's very, very refined, very high quality, re high resolution images, and multiple layers of it. And, uh, and after that, we need to derive the base call from those images, meaning that when this location for the first nucleotide is A, C, G, or T, we want to identify those. And that those are called the base call part. And after that, we still need to do the genome alignment. OK, for the image part, so the high seq technology, and this is not the latest uh, biochemistry of uh, high seq 2000, actually. The, two, the latest one is uh, uh, 2000, the, I think it's a 350G run. And the image data is a 32 terabytes, just for one run, OK? And uh, in our CCBB right now, our uh, storage capacity probably is uh, uh, we have two backup servers. Each one is uh, uh, 54 terabytes. And uh, I, I, I thought it was pretty big. And uh, apparently, that uh, uh, one run of a sequencer will take, take most of it if we really store this uh, image data. And the uh, intensity signal is about two terabytes. Uh, uh, base call quality data is about 250 gigabits. And alignment output can be uh, 1.2 um, uh, terabytes 
uh, for if we got all the intermediate files removed. So you can see this is the size of the data we're talking about. Actually, if you talk about this level, alignment output, or even the base call level, this, we, we can store those. So those are, are fine. But, but for the earlier part, it's, it's a big challenge. And this is a, a very early um, uh, uh, run so for, the, for the Illumina GA2 50G run. So image size is 5.6 terabytes. And the alignment output eventually is 300 gigabits. So those are still big numbers, but comparing to these 32 terabytes, and it's a lot better. Okay. And uh, so as I mentioned, that the first level of uh, data is actually the image data, the raw image data. They are very, very large. Okay. So 32 terabytes for one run. But the issue is here: should we really keep it? Okay. We know that a lot of institutions, they do not keep it, and we do not keep it as well. So once we generate the data, we calculate the base call, we throw the, the raw image away. It's just too expensive to, to store those data. It probably is as expensive as re regenerated the data. Okay? And there's a problems with that. Uh, the major problem is uh, um, when, the so when the sequencer company, when they updated their software to derive the base call from the raw image. And uh, your later calls, and, the, and before and after the switch, and they are not comparable anymore. And that happened once for, for the Illumina from 1.3 to 1.4 um, version change. And they, that happened once. And a lot of institutions, they were really panicked at that moment. But what you can do with it? And there's a data is just too expensive to store. It's more expensive than you can you regenerate. So a lot of institutions actually they keep the samples, and if they need to re to get data back again, they regenerate it. <laughs> and uh, processing the data, uh, process the data for the BAM file, and we will talk about that. It's about one terabyte, one gigabit for every 20 million sequence rates, and it's much acceptable. So it's a, we we those are the level of data we will. Uh, really uh, save. And for the data transfer, if you think of data storage is such a big issue, data transfer is impossible, right? If we do some experiment, we send a big samples to Beijing Genome Institute, which is across the world, and you want to transfer that data back and uh, through internet, that's a lot of bandwidth to really transfer those data back. back. Uh, HTTP and FTP protocols won't work an, a, anymore. And some uh, the ones that computer, science, computer technology companies, and they develop the commercial software for protocol become important. And there's a, a protocol for next generation of file transport, and uh, this is the speed that they, they will get uh, when you transfer data from uh, long distance. And uh, so far, the best technology we are using is a hard drive put the data into a hard drive and uh, fed, FedEx and send to us. So, and it, it only takes overnight. It's very secure and, uh, and very fast. Um, so, and and uh, we, we had that a couple, of, uh, a couple of weeks ago. We want to transfer some data. It was MCF7 DNA sequencing data. We want to transfer that from Ohio State back to here. And it, it takes uh, about three weeks of transferring and we gave up, so <laughs> we still eventually get the data from the hard drive. Okay, so a lot of things going on, a lot of information, a lot of number crunching, and uh, but if we break the analysis into smaller pieces, actually these are the steps. It includes the primary analysis, the secondary analysis, and the tertiary analysis. I know these names doesn't make any sense. I didn't make those. Okay, somebody else defined those. For the primary analysis, we basically don't, don't need to worry about that. It's from the original image and get the base call. So we know that which nucleotide is A, C, G, T. And uh, usually the, the software from the, the sequencer itself will, will help us to generate this. And uh, for the bioinformatics part, we really start from secondary analysis, which include sequence alignment, sequence status. Okay, you want to calculate those. And consensus calling, we will talk about that. And create a QC file, quality control, how the data look like, and tag counting and sequence assembly. And all these things are considered as a secondary analysis. So you can, if you, 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 you distinguish a secondary 
with the tertiary is uh, there's not too much biology part kick in in the secondary. So it's, it's more like the data processing, basic data processing part is something that we will be dealing with today. And for the tertiary analysis, uh, that will be very biological application specific. It can be DNA sequencing, including resequencing or de novo sequencing. It's a different workflow. And uh, for the chip seek, identify peaks, or, or for the HISM markers, what, whatever other things you can do. For the RNA sequencing, to calculate the gene expression, to calculate alternative splicing, to, to identify the variants on the transcripts, all, all those things. And for the epigenetics and for the DNA methylation, how do we uh, further analyze the data? So most of the, the bioinformatics part, to get, this part really needs to work together with the biologists and to make sense of the original data. And for the biologists, especially we have the students from the School of Medicine and come here. And uh, this part sounds like not important. And, and uh, true, this part is something you do not have to run. Okay, and the bioinformatician will generate. However, you, it's really beneficial that you know what is the algorithm they use, what is the, the good thing and bad things about individual ones, so that you can critically assess what about how well or how bad the bioinformaticians did, right? So don't just take us for granted. The data we gave to you, a lot of them are not really optimal, so you have to critically look at that. And uh, in terms of where this analysis will be done, for the first part, it's usually done in the sequencing core, so we don't have to worry about that. For the second part, since it's not really biological application specific, and uh, most of the pipelines is already ready, so bioinformatics are, should be able to take care of this part. And, uh, and we are working with the bioinformatics core here and trying to pass some of the jobs to them as well. And for the data analysis says part, this one is really a teamwork. So it needs the computer scientists, it needs the biostatisticians, bioinformaticians together with biologists and to make sense of individual data. Okay? All right, the major steps for the secondary analysis, so I'm talking about the middle part. It's really not too much biology, uh, biological application related. And you got the raw data out of a sequencer, and this will be big, huge data. And you want to first look at the qualities, and you want to see the quality, how well the quality is, and how, what's the, the strategy you want to filter out the bad ones. And next step is alignment. So the so-called alignment is you got the reference genome. Okay, this is one of the sequence reads. You want to know this 50 base pair, which part of genome it comes from. And then you run through certain algorithms, then you figure out, oh, this one is coming from here, and this is process is called alignment. There are some situations that one reads can, multi, can uh, align to multiple locations in the genome, and uh, which is, happens very often because we know that human genomes are very repetitive. And the next step is the annotation part. So after you identify those biological signals, and then you want to know which part of the gene it's, it is. is. Is that in the intron region of the gene or exon region? And those type of annotation is very important. And after that, and the, you send the data to, to the analysis team that, that we can start to make the biological stories. OK. Um, for the sequence uh, uh, quality. The quality is key, uh, of course, right? So I, I got this uh, from lab, and it's money, time, and quality. This is uh, something that doesn't really come together sometimes. Uh, they are not agree with each other. And uh, by sequencing, a poor library will actually waste your money. That's uh, for sure, right? And uh, the sequencing reagent cost is huge, and cost of uh, storing the raw data is pretty big, and CPU times requires is, is, is bad. Uh, and most importantly, the cost of analyzing this bad data are, are really cost you a lot of time and money. And uh, there's some not very smart practice, but we see a lot of biologists do. And the first one is uh, not checking the sample QC before the sequencing. So they get the samples and they send uh, to the core facility, want them to do the sequencing. This is not smart. And uh, one common mistake that people make is that they will skip the biological replicates. They thought this will save them money. Okay, when you run uh, two samples, uh, two conditions, okay, I got MCF7, I treat with a certain drug, and, uh, and I want to run RNA sequencing experiment. 
And uh, so uh, we know that if we do the experiment design is proper, and we sh what we should is uh, for each condition, we get multiple samples, and then we do the sequencing, and then that offers us enough statistical power. But a lot of uh, situations that people want to save money, and they just skip the that replicate. So they just uh, sequence one sample from the MCF7, the other one from the drug treated group. And that will cause the experiment much, much under the power. And, uh, but that can be um, um, uh, solved by uh, sequencing more duplicates in the later stage. But at this stage, you really need to be very careful. The, the experimental design needs to be balanced. So meaning that in the future, when you sequence, uh, so you say, oh, I probably see some signals. I want to do more experiment on these samples or the similar conditions. And uh, when you do the later runs, you want to make sure that you have both control and uh, and uh, uh, treated samples in the later runs as well. You do not want to say, the first run, I put all my control in the first run, and I put all my treatment in the second run. That's the common mistake people will make, right? And then you see the difference between two groups. You will never figure out whether that difference is because of the real biological difference or because some technician made some mistake or there's some variation in different runs. So, so you want to make sure the experimental design is really balanced. OK, goes to the real thing of next generation sequencing. So what does this quality mean? So we often see that, that quality. And let me show you what this figure means first. So you can see this is the reference genome. OK, this is the reference. And these are different sequencing runs. And they have already been aligned here. OK? When we talk about the quality, in the future, I want you to keep in mind about that as well. When we talk about the quality, it's not one thing. Quality is not a word okay, it's here. So it doesn't mean anything. There's a three different types of quality. So every time when we talk about the quality, we want to identify which quality we are talking about. The first quality is uh, the so-called base quality. Okay? And uh, for example, it got the first sequence pack here, so you can see the colors. And the colors really uh, is, is encoded for the, the quality of that sequence. All right? So if I know, I say this is A here, what is the quality of uh, that is A? All right? So that is called the base quality. Basically, it tells you how accurate the sequencer sequenced to get, get this ACDT sequence arm. And uh, the base quality will be for every nucleotide and it will be reported by the sequencer. OK? The second level quality is uh, called the mapping quality, or some, in some conditions called alignment quality. So meaning that if I got this rays, the sequence rays, I want to align it back to the genome, I, and I say, OK, after my blast or other alignment algorithm, that I know that this rate aligned here. So what is the pr probability that I made a mistake? Okay, so the mapping quality is very, very important as well. Okay, so if you, you say there's a two mismatch in, the, in this alignment, and how likely that will happen by random. So those kind of uh, uh, evaluations are called mapping quality. And the mapping quality is uh, one quality for every read. And uh, this will be reported by the aligner. Does that make sense? The third quality we are talking about is uh, the so-called consensus quality, which means after this alignment has been done, and I want to know whether this part is a variant or not. So is this a heterozygous variant or homozygous variant? And this, and I, I also can calculate a p-value associated to that, and that is called consensus quality, which is a variant call quality. So we will have a consensus quality for every genomic locus that we have. And also, this one is reported by the variant colors. All right, does that make sense? So keep in mind, there's three levels of quality. The base quality reported by the sequencer, the mapping quality reported by the aligner, and the consensus quality reported by the variant colors. So we will go through all these different qualities. Okay. And uh, the first one, before we go into any detail of any quality, 
And there's one thing called a FRAB score, and it's used very widely in the next generation sequencing data process. Let me tell you what that is, okay? So the first FRAB score was published in 1998 in these two papers, and they were both on genome research, and they were initially developed for the Human Genome Project. Remember that ancient Human Genome Project, right? And uh, it's now widely used to characterize the quality of DNA sequencing. All right, so some of the biologists probably see this uh, type of figures uh, all the time, especially we are in the genetics department. I have never seen this. I want to make it clear, right? I, I wasn't trained as a biologist. But for the people who does sequencing, and this is the figure they will stare at every day, okay? So you can see that there, there are different colors, and each color corresponding to A, C, G, or T. And at one location, if there's a green, that means this is the A or, or things like that, right? So if you, the point here is uh, if you see there's a sharp peak of a color and there's not other signals around there, and it's very clear that this is A or C, right? So your quality of that base color is very accurate. And for a location like this, you got multiple colors so stacking together, and there's a bad peak, not really a narrow, nice, thin one. And uh, the quality is not going to be very good. Okay. So the FRAB score actually is evaluated the base color quality for each individual location. And the definition is kind of simple, actually. So you can see that if we are very familiar with the p-value or things like that, right? So if we know that the p-value is 0.1, and that means our accuracy is 90%, right? If zero p-value is 0 0.01 and accuracy is 99%, so so on and so forth. So the, the quality definition for the FRAS score is minus 10 times log 10p, okay? So it's just a convenient way to transfer these small numbers, more and more zeros in front, into this number that is nice and easy to look at, okay? So Often that we are always use the Q is 20 as a, as a sum of the rule and, 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 and Q is, is equal to 20, that means the p-value is 0 0.01. That means that if I sequence 100 nucleotides, I had one make, make mistake. If I run them, I will have one make mistake. All right? I don't know which one, but I will have one make, make mistake. So those are the what, what the base call quality really means. Okay? So the point here for this slide is the quality score, and this is a, the so-called FRAD scale, and which is a simple transformation for the p-value. Okay? So this will be used repeatedly. Okay. Now we are talking about sequence alignment. Okay? The first sequence, so what is sequence alignment? It's a way of arranging the sequence of DNA, RNA, or protein to identify regions of similarity. And it helps to in inferring functional structure of evolution relationship between the sequences. The goal here actually is to find out the best matching sequences. If you get one sequence, two sequence, and the best matching sequence, that's, that's what your goal is. And there's a two type of sequencing. Uh, one is uh, the global alignment. The other one is the local alignment. So I don't want to give some strict definition on this since those doesn't make any sense anyways. So, but you can see these figures. This really tells you what global and local alignments means, right? For the global alignment, you want to, for these two sequences, you want them to align together. You want to account every single nucleotide. But for the local alignment, you just want to find the, the, the agreed regions between these two, okay? And uh, um, in terms of alignment theories, the the goal of alignment is analytically determine the best alignment between two sequences. Well, when we talk about this is what is the best? This is a, a hard thing to, to define, right? And for the proteins that we will have this type of very um, uh, well-defined uh, penalty matrix, the so-called penalty matrix. So you, can, you, you, you cannot see very clear, and I cannot see even from here. But this is a 20 amino acid, this is another 20 amino acid. Okay. You can find out this uh, in, in, the, in the lecture notes. And uh, these are the numbers. So if, uh, if it is a perfect aligned, there will be a positive number. And if it's a misalignment, there will be a, a negative number. And by the end of the day, that if there's a mismatch, so 
So because of the, the, the biochemistry features of different uh, amino acids, so some of the mismatch has uh, more penalty, others have less penalty, and think so on and so forth. So you will need a scoring matrix or penalty scheme for this uh, protein alignment. For the nucleotide alignment, it becomes much easier, and for the DNA or RNA, so you just basic, basically you give them scores, right? If there's a match, and you give a one. If it's a mismatch, you give a zero. If there's a gap, you give a penalty, okay? It becomes uh, simple. So, so these uh, penalty levels is the way that you can define it. Based on this scheme, I, I'm giving you this example. So you can see this is uh, two nucleotide, two sequences, and it, uh, p clearly there's a gap here. And uh, actually, there's an eight nucleotide match here. So you give this a score, it's eight. And the minus, because there is a gap here, so you already gave a three penalty, minus a three. And every additional uh, gap, you give a 0 0.1 extension penalty. So the alignment score between these two sequences will be 4.8. Okay, very simple stuff. All right, so you, you do need this kind of uh, um, penalty scheme to define what is the by best alignment, right? We were hoping that everything is perfectly aligned, but that's not going to happen. Yeah? Oh, for this one times three plus and this. So for the, if there's a gap, regardless, uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, whether this is one base pair in the gap or a three base pair, you will get, as long as the gap created, so you got a three penalty. So every additional base, and you will get another 0 0.1 uh, extension penalty. Well, these can be defined differently. Actually, different aligners can define this differently as well. This is just one example. OK? All right. Um, the goal of alignment is that there's uh, two goals. One is a global alignment and the local alignment. The global alignment is alignment must account for all the characteristics of each sequence. Okay, actually, it's not used in the next generation sequencing technology, and uh, the algorithm to do that is called Needleman Wunsch, and uh, uh, algorithm. And uh, but the local alignment, uh, the goal is alignment accounts for only a continuous portion of each sequence, like this. And uh, the algorithm itself is uh, the famous Smith-Wortman algorithm, right? I wanted to just talk about Smith-Wortman algorithm, but later I figured out it's easier to talk about this first and then, gives you, uh, and then tran transition it to the, to the Smith-Wortman. Um, and uh, the next couple of slides is from Dr. Shen Li. Uh, from uh, Center for Computational Biology and Bioinformatics, and uh, he is trained as a computer scientist, and he's teaching the bioinformatics course in, in the School of Medicine. Um, so this is uh, the, a couple of slides about dynamic programming, how this global uh, alignment works. So there's three major steps. The first one is the creation of a, a alignment path matrix, and the second one is the stepwise calculation for the prefix alignment scores and backtracking. You don't know what that means, all right? So let's, let's get, get into it. So actually, it's quite simple. So you can see there's a one sequence here, and there's a another sequence here. Keep in mind, this is a protein sequence. For the nucleotide, there will be the same thing, OK? But I'm just using the current protein sequence as an example, OK? For every gap, for this particular case, for every gap created, you will get a minus 8 penalty, OK? So you can see that initially, this one doesn't align to anything, doesn't align to anything. So every additional gap, there's a minus 8 score penalty. And so is this one, all right? And uh, what we are trying sorry. What I'm trying to figure out here is, uh, is uh, fill in this uh, penalty matrix, OK? So you, what our goal is to calculate this number and based on the three numbers here. So if I calculate this number, I want to base on this, 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 and the alignment performance. So that is uh, the point. And uh, the creation of alignment path matrix, so what we, we first say is you can see this is a P, and there's a H here, right? And uh, we got our um, penalty score from this blossom, the, the, the matrix, the smaller matrix that I show you. 
for P versus H, the penalty is minus 2. So what I'm going to put in this number is this, OK? So for this number, it will be determined by these three numbers, OK? For this case, all right, I'm going to calculate from here, and then for this one, P versus H, this will be minus 2, right? 0 plus minus 2. So this is a minus 2 here. Or I could come from this path, which is minus 8. This is another gap here, which is minus 16. And or from here to here, this is minus 16. And the maximum value of all these three will be minus 2. Okay? So what I'm going to put is so I put minus 2 here, and I make a record that this minus 2 is derived from this particular location. Okay? And then next, I'm going to worry about this uh, value. So again, this value follows the same scheme. This value will be calculated based on these three uh, numbers. Okay? Now I have this P versus E, and uh, the penalty is minus 1. Okay? So you got here is uh, from this one, this will be the minus 8, because we calculated this minus 8. Minus 1, this is the minus 9 here, okay? And for this one, it's coming from here, minus 2, and the gap is minus 8, so this is minus 10. And minus 16, and the gap is minus, uh, another minus 8, so minus 24. And these three numbers, the largest is minus 9 here. And you just put minus 9 here. And also you want to record it that this number is coming from this path, okay? Now you calculate this one and follow the same strategy. But there's a, in this case, we have a tie here. Both are minus 10. So we'll still put minus 10 here, and I will put uh, this record. Uh, so this, this minus 10 is derived from both these two. Okay? So based on this uh, simple strategy, and uh, you will calculate this one, and I'm not going to go through it, and it comes from here. So based on this simple strategy, all the numbers in this matrix will be calculated, okay? And the uh, next step is you want to do the backtracking. So the so-called backtracking is you start from this location, so the, the score is minus uh, is 1. So you first you want to see this 1, it comes from this part, okay? And then you see this is E, this is E, so you know that these two E's aligned together. Okay, and then you come, come to this number minus 5, and this minus 5 comes from this part, and you know this is a gap here because it, it doesn't come directly from here. So you can see this A is aligned to a gap. And this minus 3 comes to here, 3 comes to here, follow this path, and this will be another alignment which is E versus E. So you can, you can put E versus E here. And then you step by step follow this path. Eventually, you will derive this uh, potential global alignment. Let me finish the animation of this. Now you, you focus this, uh, um, and finish this uh, alignment. So this is the, the so-called optimal uh, alignment. All right. And uh, so, so that is uh, uh, the, the Needleman uh, watch. Algorithm is not difficult, but you have to sit down to think through it if you haven't heard about that. Um, but the, the point here is uh, what, what we really want for the next generation sequencing is so-called local alignment, right? So we got one sequence raised is about 50 base pair. We want to know which part of the genome come from. We are not going to align it against the, the entire genome from the very beginning to the end. We only want to find out the local regions that, that aligned. So it, the same, the, the scoring system is uh, exactly the same as uh, the, the global alignment. The, the only difference is uh, there is, uh, so the searching can start from anywhere. So if it initially it gets into the negative score cat categories, and it's always a zero here. And another thing is the uh, searching can end at anywhere, okay? So what happens is, uh, for the smith wortman algorithm, the same matrix will happen. This is a, um, so remember, all these numbers were minus numbers. But if there's a lot of minus numbers, you just put a zero here. 
and all the alignment only start from a non-zero score comes out, a positive score, score comes out. And this will be the, the smith waterman matrix. And uh, the backtracking part, it will start from the largest number within this matrix. And then you will follow, further follow the same path here. And eventually, you will derive this uh, smaller region, the local region, where the, the, the alignment occurred. So you can see that uh, based on this particular path, uh, and this is, this is the end of it because it reached to zero. And then now this is the optimal local alignment. Okay? So if you haven't, I, I know this, this cannot be done for one, just a, a few minutes. But uh, uh, if you want to think about that, and this is, uh, um, you can go back to, and uh, it's not that difficult to figure out. Okay. So the algorithm is there. Uh, there's a problem. So we know that uh, smith waterman or also the dynamic algorithm for the, uh, for the alignment, especially for the local alignment, we know it will guarantee give you the best optimal alignment. Okay? So that is, uh, has been proved the theory. But the problem to calculate this entire matrix is uh, too costly. So if you think of uh, one, this, uh, this part is the sequence raised. This is the entire human genome. And if you really want to calculate this, only one read, you, how many numbers you need to calculate, right? It's just impossible to go through smith waterman in this fashion. Especially we are talking about not one read, but trillions of reads, OK? And uh, therefore, fast alignment has uh, become very, very important. So there's a fast alignment for short reads, OK? For the uh, short race aligners, there's some major challenges. The first major challenge is going through one trillion race using dynamic programming is not practic practical. And one of the strategies to do this is uh, to make a dictionary. Or in computer science term, they call it an index. Okay? So what happens is uh, you, make, you, you have your old, old reference genome is already there, right? So from ACGT and to whatever is the three billion letters. And then you want to find out, uh, this is an example of a full nucleotide index. So I want to record all the locations of AAAA. Okay, there, there will be a lot of those, right? But you can make a dictionary of all the AAAAs. Next time, when you got a sequence and you just grab the first four rays, Okay, and then you, for, for, first the four nucleotides, let's say it's AACA or AAAC, and then you go to the, your dictionary and to check, oh, AAAC, and these are the genomic lo locations that have the AAAC there, right? But that is only taking care of the first two nucleotides, and you can still do smith waterman algorithm starting from there. But that part, the searching will be in a restricted region, that not the entire human genome anymore. Okay? But the problem for this type of strategy is uh, making a 50 nucleotide index is too large. We know that there's a 50 letters, and each letter, each location potentially has four letters. And uh, this, la this uh, scheme is 1.3 times 10 power 30. And also, most of algorithms, you need to load the entire index into the memory. It's just not practical. So making a, a such an a index is too huge. Okay? So it, it's not going to work. There are a couple of, uh, uh, bef there's a couple of uh, uh, strategies that can help us uh, for the short, time, short race aligners. But before we get into that, we need to know what we are dealing with. And the features of this race is a short and a massive amount. And the cost here we need to consider, which is the speed, how fast you need to do the alignment, and also the resources that are required. The resource here meaning the memory, right? We know that for most of the laptop, you have 4 gig based memory, maybe 8. And for, for desktop, you've got a little bit more. But uh, for the servers, and, uh, and the largest server in my lab is only 48 gig memory, right? So we, we know that university have a half a terabyte of memory that's a supercomputer. But, um, but, but memory is an issue. So you need to consider how much memory is required for each alignment algorithm. And there's another one is for the alignment quality, meaning that there's a lot of fast aligners. 
they do not allow gaps. Okay, so it's it's that's the one of the ways they make make their their alignment faster. And if the gaps are some something that you're concerned about, and those are of the algorithm you cannot use, and we will go through those as well. And uh, information considered, some of the algorithm just strictly get the ACGT numbers from the read and do the alignment, and other algorithm rather you also use the base calculate. So basically, if you got a 50 base pair nucleotide, you align to the to the genome. There's a three nucleotide mismatched, but one two of them are the base quality is not very good, and you probably want to discount the contribution of those two nucleotides. So some of the alignment algorithms do use the base quality information, others do not. And accuracy as well, and uh, we have one a couple of slides about that. So there's a couple for so I'm not trying to teach you any specific uh, short rays aligner. They are all very well done. Okay, uh, but I want to, in terms of theory wise, I want to summarize what type of strategy that people start to take in terms of uh, solving that uh, the problem that we had. Right, the problem is uh, that we have massive amount and dynamic programming is too slow. And the first uh, common strategy is a uh, hash table based strategy. This is uh, the so-called seed and extension paradigm. So you can imagine here, this is the sequence read, 50 base pair, and this is the reference genome. Okay? You cannot really index the entire thing. 50 base pair is too big. Rather, you only index the very beginning part of it. It's, uh, it's called a seed. Okay? If your seed is long enough, and you can create enough specificity on the genome. So what you do is you first index the seed, and then you align the seed back to the reference genome, and then you further start from there, because now you don't deal with the whole entire human genome, but rather very small parts, it's very close to the seed part. And then you further do the extension and to calculate how well these two sequences matches. So you can see that I make it a little fint, saying this two doesn't really uh, align well, and this one really aligns strongly, and the, and that will help you to speed up the alignment uh, process. Okay, very straightforward way of thinking. Okay, and uh, and uh, for the suffix and there the second strategy is called the so-called suffix tree and prefix tree, and uh, suffix array of boros velar transformation. Uh, we'll get into that, and uh, uh, so so it's a lot of fun to go through that and. Uh, and the, set, the third one is uh, called the merge sorting, and this is not really commonly used, so I'm not going to talk about that. So these two are the major things, okay? And uh, most of the current published uh, two dozen also aligners, they are either hash table based or suffix tree based, okay? So you can really pick the ones they want to use. For the hash table based and uh, the algorithm, so let's have a few slides about that. Then the first one is, uh, the, the feature is uh, very straightforward, okay? So you got, uh, so we mentioned that we got, uh, this is a, a dictionary, you just make this dictionary, it will sit into your memory, and, and anytime you see a nucleotide, you, you want to go that place and to find, and, and then to do the extension, right? And the size is a full power K records for K more hash table. So if it's, uh, you got a, Four nucleotides, that will be four power four. If you want to build a 15 nucleotides hash table, and that is about the size that most people are using, or, or 14 or 13, and that will be four power 13. And, uh, and that is still workable. So if you make the calculation, they can, that, that size of a seed can really sit in your memory. That's no problem. Okay, so the seed extension par paradigm. So you, you can imagine that this is uh, the query sequence and the seed, and the we, we, we make a, a pretty good dictionary, and then go back. Once I start from the seed, and I know there's a, maybe half a dozen locations in the genome has the seed, and I further do the extension to calculate how well it match. Okay? And uh, there's a couple of algorithms using this uh, uh, hash table based algorithm, uh, some of them are very uh, widely used and uh, including the ELAND, which is hashing, indexing the read. There's a two sub-strategies. Sub the first one is indexing the read. The other one is indexing the genome. 
and uh, to index the read, and the most famous one will be the Eland algorithm. And I'm not going to talk about that because we are not allowed to talk about that. Not really, but we don't know the details. It's commercial software, and they never published their algorithm. And that is the one that Illumina was using very initially. Okay, and uh, MAQ is a hash table base, and Mazak is, and they both are hashing the 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 reads. And there's also some others hashing the reference genome, including BFAS, Mozak, and SOAP. Okay? And BFAS is really the one that we are using in my group right now. Okay? All right. But you may think, if you think deeper, if you think deeper about this, okay, if perfect match is straightforward, right? So if I want to find, if I got a nucleotide 50 base pair, I want to find in the genome what is, what, where it comes from. If everything is a perfect match, it's pretty simple. But it's not useful to identify genetic variants for the hash table based study, right? Keep in mind, if there's a SNP happens in the seed location, okay, the initial seeding will be missed. You will never find that nucleotide anymore, that, that alignment anymore. That caused a lot of trouble because one of the point that we are doing sequencing is to identify genetic variants, right? So the algorithm needs to take care of it, and here is how. The solution is to use the multiple, in I mean, the reason I talk about this is while I was reading all these things, and those are the questions that come into my mind, so I have to read deeper to find out how they solve it, okay? So I want, want you to just follow this, uh, this strategy. The solution here is uh, using multiple indexes that allow mismatch. One example is here. So if I have this 16 nucleotide read, I want to do the alignment. If I do not allow any mismatch, I can make a 16 base pair hash table, right? Just straightforward, done. However, if I allow one base pair mismatch, and this will be the strategy I'm taking, okay? So I'm going to only hash the last eight or the first eight, okay? And there's a zeros here. The zeros are the nucleotide positions that I'm not going to consider. So what happens is uh, for any string with one nucleotide mismatch can be covered by at least one of these two indexes, okay? If the mismatch happens here, and uh, this index will still cover that. This is really for the sensitivity issue. If you, if, if you do not allow mismatch, your sensitivity goes dramatically down. So by this way, using these two mismatch, two uh, uh, indexes schemes, so that you can really take care of or allow one nucleotide mismatch for anything happens. Does that make sense? Okay, so any string with one nucleotide mismatch can be covered by at least one of these indexes. So this matrix is called a mask. Okay, you have to know about it. And there's a specific ways to design this mask, which is very interesting. Okay, we got a mask. But there's one, more than one way to build the mask. Let, let's go through this. So you still get this 16 nucleotide uh, read. Okay, so this is the, our way to, to build the mask so that you can allow one base pair mismatch, okay? And there's a, several different statistics in there. The first one is M, which is the seed length. The seed length is, is the 16 base pair, okay? K is one, K is the number of mismatch allowed. And the W is eight. W is within each seed how many ones we have. So meaning that how many nucleotides I'm accounted to build this index. For this one, W is eight. And N, which is the number of index, is two. So we got the two um, index that can cover everything. But this is another way to build the index, right? So this is a, also a valid scheme. So you, you get, so, so the point of this index is really, if I have one nucleotide mismatch, and I can find it from any one of these uh, 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 indexes. And uh, this is another one, and uh, which is uh, probably a better one uh, to a certain extent. 
which you can see that the W is equal to 14, meaning for each individual index, there's a 14 nucleotide has been counted. However, you need eight such index to cover everything. Okay? So the point here is if there's one nucleotide mismatch from the original seed index, uh, the, the, this uh, uh, original rate, and you will be able to find it from at least one of these, uh, uh, these indexes. Okay? All right. But we are having a problem. So we, we have this, uh, this 16 nucleotide, and there's uh, multiple ways to build these indexes. But we have a problem here. The first problem is uh, the seed weight, W, should not be too small. So you remember we got a 16 base pair nucleotide, and when we break it into two, our weight become eight. All right? The problem of eight is uh, too small to avoid many false positives that will allow the mapping process. Okay? My initial goal is to build a 16 nucleotide index. All right? So maybe there's a three places in the genome has it. However, if I reduce it to eight, and there probably is a 10,000 locations in the genome has it, and there will be a lot of false positives, at least for the seeding part. Of course, you can get rid of those after the further alignment, the extension part, but that will take a lot of time to figure that those out. So that will slow down the process. But the higher the seed weight is, the more seed would be needed to achieve full sensitivity. So you can see that this one, that the, the weight is eight, you need two. The weight is 14, you need eight such kind of indexes. And uh, if you have things like this, you run into another problem that you have too many indexes needs to be loaded into the memory, and that eventually will also slow down your mapping process. Okay? So how to design those, uh, those masks, really, um, uh, it was a, a topic a couple of years ago. Yeah. So, so you are talking about a, a shifted seed in the in the read, is that right? Okay. So 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 the question is, uh, if you got a 50 base pair read, you design a 16 base pair uh, seed, and uh, so we are talking about uh, the seed and extension. You, you first use the first 16 nucleotide, and and then you do the extension. And the Jake's point is, uh, why don't we do the shifting and uh, and to account for this, and. Uh, and that will be very, also very complicated. So most of alignment algorithm that requires a two nucleotide mismatch, okay, allow two nucleotide mismatch. So the notion for that is, uh, uh, there probably there's one SNP, and also allow one nucleotide for sequencing error, okay. So once you got a two nucleotide mismatch, and that two nucleotides can happen anywhere, and how do you do the shifting? Will become an issue. You may end up spending more time to figure that out. Okay, but but uh, let me go through this so you will know there's an optimal design for this, which is uh, really really nice. And the question here is, uh, does uh, optimal design exist? Actually, it it does. Okay, and uh, so you can read that later. But let me give you the point here. Um, there is a, a beautiful work from Chinese Anatomy of Science and from 2008. So what they do is they publish optimal mask design algorithm. So what, what happens, and they also build this into their uh, uh, aligner, they call it Zoom, zillions of oligos mapped. Okay? And it's not really supported anymore, but it was a, a very uh, academic way to solve this problem. So, so what, what happens is uh, they give you the best design, the best optimal solution. So you can see this table. Uh, you cannot see from very, very well from the back. But you can see this is uh, the read length that you are targeting. For example, this is 33 or to 36, 25. And this is the mismatch allowed. It's a two mismatch if you allow two mismatches. And this will be the number of indexes needed for a specific weight. So let's say if uh, 
for a, let me go through it. For a 33 nucleotide read, okay, if your weight is 14, and you can look at this table that you know that you need a four index, you can find out a way to design four index to cover everything that have two base pair mismatch. Okay, here's the proof. Okay, so the seed length, the seed length is 33, 33, and the weight is 13. Okay, mismatch allowed is is two, and this number is equal to four. So you need this four uh, index to cover all this uh, this uh, this this reads, and at the same time allow two mismatches. So uh, I, I actually I, I stared um, at this for about 10 minutes and trying to uh, prove they're wrong, <laughs> okay? So, so basically I was trying to say, here these two nucleotides are mismatched. And, and it will always be taken care of by one of the seed uh, indexes in here, all right? So we don't have to do this now, but if you find the NA2 mismatch were not taken care of by any one of it, let me know. We have to get their paper withdrawn. All right, so, so but I, I think this is a really very interesting academic way to, to solve this problem, and that this was published in 2008. And actually, many later aligners using this type of strategy to design their matrix, uh, mask matrix. Okay? So, I, I guess this is a fun practice, right? So you got the seed, we know the seed extension, and we know the problem if you only focus on the seed, you're running into trouble because you are not allowing nucleotide mismatch into the seed. So using this type of mask design can help us to solve it. So if you, for the, for the students in the room, by the way, that we will have homeworks, okay? And uh, when we do the homeworks, and, and I'm going to ask you to do the, to the install the aligners, so you will realize, uh, I thought there's one index, only one index. Actually, there are some aligners that are 10 indexes, and this is what happens, right? This is the way that they design the, the mask and matrix, and, uh, and that can help us to take care of um, mismatches. And here, it's a simple thing. I'm only talking about the mismatches. Some of aligners, they were trying to tolerate gaps in this and to design some other novel uh, matrix, and uh, it's, it's even more complicated. But the point is here. Any questions so far? Are we still following? All right, good, hopefully. All right, and uh, the hash table strategy is good. So you got a uh, seed extension, seed extension, okay. And the problem of a hash table based strategy is alignment to multiple identical copies of a substring in the reference must be performed for each copy. So what I mean here is, uh, there is, a, we know that human genome are very repetitive. So there is a lot of uh, regions that it happens many, many, many times, okay? And, uh, and uh, for this type of uh, uh, method is once you got a seed and then you map it, you, you, you use the seed to identify the, the potential locations for the dual extension. And if there's a, a really a, a repetitive region, for every single location, you really need to go through this Smith-Watson algorithm, so which can be very, very slow, okay? So there are some solutions for that, which is to use a suffix or prefix tree that can handle this. How many of you have taken the algorithm class uh, in computer science? So, so you heard about this uh, suffix tree, prefix tree, right? I've never heard about that before. And I'm not going to tell you that how to do it, but but let me tell you what I understand about it, and I think that will be enough for the biologists. <laughs> All right. So what happens here is uh, this is uh, becomes your reference genome. Okay? It's weird, I know. So what happens is uh, you got a reference genome, which is three billion letters, and that can you can really generate a huge, huge tree and that represents this reference genome. I'm not going to tell you how to generate that tree, and it's complicated, but, but it's doable. But the point of this is searching become very, very fast, very fast. So let's go through this, okay? So 
what I talk about is, let's say our reference genome is only four base pair and six base pair. And this is six base pair is extended to this huge humongous tree, okay? However, let's do the searching. So if I want to search AGG, whether AGG is in here, so what happens is you always start from the node, the, 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 the root, and then you search from the back. I'm searching AGG. So you will search G, G, A, all right? So you can always search from the back. So everything that from the root, you will have a path to there, okay? And uh, uh, the computer scientist told me that uh, this gives you a very fast searching scheme, which is O n, which n is the size of your read, not the query sequence, which is a 50 base pair, not the, the, the length of the entire human genome, which can be very, very huge. So the seeding, the, the searching part is very, very fast. Okay, you probably still don't know how this works, and uh, I'm not going to explain that because I don't know either. Uh, but that's okay. So, so uh, it's not going to be used anyways. And the, there's a bigger problem of this tree is uh, we I have to design a six nucleotide, and this tree will become this big. It's impractical to make the index for the entire human genome into such a tree. Okay. But this, uh, the point of this uh, suffix tree and prefix tree is uh, the searching, the query part. Once the index is established, which index is this tree, and uh, the searching part, the query become really, really, really fast. Okay. Well, for the smith wortman as you, you can imagine, for every sequence alignment, what I have to do is uh, to generate this big matrix and do the backtracking, and that's not going to happen, especially one of the the, the read sequence here is a, it's a reference genome with just three billion letters. But uh, for the suffix to prefix tree, and uh, to do this searching is extremely fast. Okay. Um, I'm going to take a 10 minutes break, and uh, coming back, we'll talk about the uh, uh, Boros Wheeler transformation. And uh, this is uh, uh, something it's very, very popular right now in alignment algorithm. And, uh, and the most important ones, the BOTA and the BWA, they were all based on this. And, uh, and for the biologists in the room, you probably don't even know these type of things. But however, I, I, I need, still need to talk about that because if you are an informatics student, you want to look for jobs. And I'm afraid this is one of the questions that they want to ask you in, for the job interview. So after we come back, we'll go through this uh, Borrow-Wheeler uh, transformation, okay? 10 minutes break. <laughs>